country after country has seen its monetary system blow up in its face. And subsequently, it's had to do something about it. And we've had kind of revolutions. Now, right now, this is a very interesting subject because of the problems of the other kind of revolutions that have been taking place in, in, uh, in Russia and uh, uh, in Eastern European countries. All of a sudden, a communist system which has been an ex lasted, in Russia's case, for 70 years, in these other countries for 40 years, is blown up in their faces. Those systems had a monetary system which was part of their whole centrally planned, centrally designed system. And now they are desperately seeking what to do about that monetary system. Do they uh, keep it and re just simply replace it? And I think one of the subjects which monetary economists have been most interested in is what happens under those circumstances. In many cases, we have very straightforward results after the hyperinflation after World War I in, in Germany, Hungary, Poland, everywhere. What they all did essentially was go, go back to a kind of a pre-war system in which they established a money which was intended to be linked indirectly to a commodity, indirectly to gold, in most cases by linking it directly first to the dollar and then to gold. Mm -hmm. Under current conditions, that's not uh, the commodity doesn't enter into it, and, and it's kind of interesting to see the different shapes it's ca shape these things have taken. One of the interesting cases is one that, Dan, you know very well because you were there, and that's the one in Chile. Here you had a Chilean inflation that reached, what, about a thousand percent a year? About eighty percent a month, which com compounds out to more than a thousand percent a year. You know, eighty percent a month, if you stop thinking about that, and think about the fact that every month you're... W Almost every month, your rent doubles. And prices change between lunch and dinner. Between lunch and dinner, yeah. yeah. It actually leads to, it, when you're watching it, and I've only watched films of what it was like back in 1973 at those levels of inflation, but when you're watching that, it was something on the order of the total breakdown of society going on. I had one friend who uh, ran a sausage company, and he was trying to sell sausage from Santiago to the north of Chile, and the guy says, well, I'm not going to... He said, well, what do you have? And the person he was selling it to said, well, I have a truck of one liter oil, oil packed in one liter, in one liter containers. And this, uh, the guy said, well, I have sausages, so I'll ship you my truck of sausages, and I'll pay my workers in oil. And essentially, they just walked away from the monetary system, and it makes for an incredibly inefficient way of running a country. Um, and the Chileans have clearly been scarred by this, and the, the, the Chileans have... have since that time, instituted many interesting reforms to deal with their monetary problems. You know, the most interesting one, though, I think, and one that is at least well known, is the one by which they've separated the unit of account from the means of payment. You know, w we ordinarily don't make that distinction, ordinarily. I, you owe me $10, and you pay me $10 bills, or you pay me a check written in $10. Uh, uh, now, in the case you were describing, the means of payment was oil. <laughs> was, was oil because it was separable. That's but, right. But the unit of account, God knows what the unit of account was in that case. There wasn't any. That's correct. Uh, no He's universal unit of account. Right. Yeah. But uh, what, what the Chileans have since done is they've, they've come up with this thing called the Unidad de Fomento, which call it an, uh, an investment unit, we'll call it. And it's a number. One UF is equal to, say, 2,000 pesos. That number changes on a daily basis based on the preceding month's inflation. And therefore, it tends to be a constant purchasing power unit of account. And you'll actually can buy bonds, where it'll say your principal is 100 UFs. And you'll have coupons. Your coupon is 1 UF. You take that coupon of 1 UF to the bank, and you turn it in. And the bank teller looks up on the screen and says, the UF today is worth 2,019.37 pesos. And that's how many pesos they pay you for that coupon. And Long-term monetary transactions are organized in, in this way in Chile right now. And have been for quite a while. And How long is it, Bob? When did they uh, Back in the yeah. 70s. Late 70s, I believe. Late so 70. it's something like 15 years of experience. But you know, that's really no that's different than what they did in the German hyperinflation of 22 or 23, when they quoted prices in dollars, but were paid in marks. And they had the right. <coughs> quotations on what the foreign exchange rate was. And uh, they'd look up on, they didn't have screens in those right. days. 
they looked up at, uh, at so the, where somebody had written it down on a blackboard. The advantage of the Chilean system is that it's it's all organized and everyone uses it and understands it. It's universal. Um, as I understand it, like every uh, savings account is denominated in, yes. in U.S. So it's just automatic. There's nobody who's victimized by inflation in a savings account by having the value eroded by inflation because everybody gets this adjustment through the U.S. Who calculates the cost of living? The there's INE, it's the Instituto Nacional de Estatísticas, the, the National Statistics Institute. Yeah, it's like the that. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Yeah. It's, a it's a government yeah. function, and this whole kind of system is very sensitive to the government uh, doing an honest job of measuring the cost of living. Exactly. But That's if, they can, if a government can do that, then yeah, they can, uh, they can that kind of system it. works. You see, in the German case I was citing, it was a market-determined price. There was no government manipulation. The government could, in principle, have manipulated that price by buying and selling foreign exchange. <coughs> and the price of goods in general, the cost of living, would be a much more intelligent basis to link it. But it does bring you back to dependence on an honest governmental mm. accounting. That's correct. But, uh, another example like this is, is uh, in the early 1980s in Israel when the rates of inflation were not quite as high as the Chilean levels, but were over 100% a year. The use of the dollar for almost any kind of um, advance arrangement, like uh, al most uh, apartment uh, leases were written in dollars. And there was just a great deal of use of the dollar, not hand-to-hand, -hand, but in the same way it happens in Chile. That is, that whenever you write a contract where you pay something in the future, or you're get, getting paid interest or something like that, then, uh, then in that kind of a setting you find the use of the dollar or some other unit. You always find historical uh, precedents for these things, and it's, uh, uh, which r r shows a problem sometimes. There used to be such contracts for paying, paying gold instead of dollars. Right, and they were... They were gold in the United States, there were bonds that were issued that were called gold bonds. Exactly. Right. In which, uh, and in 1933 or 34, I guess it was, the Supreme Court declared they were not enforceable. Yes. Well, there's, uh, yeah, the, the Supreme Court upheld the validity of the law that Congress had passed. That's right. They Congress had passed a law saying... It was an inexplicable move. <coughs> that, that, uh, uh, it, it was a uh, terrible decision. It yeah. absolutely was an awful well, decision. Right. One, one of the advantages, switching back to the Chilean case, that you're able to do with a system like that is if you think of a, of a country where things really aren't working well, in the sense that inflation is varying from 2% to 10% a month, yet you could have a mortgage market where investors are willing to give their money to someone for 10 years, 15 years, as much as 20 years on mortgages to lend it to people who own houses, and accept in return a bond denominated in these, these strange units of account, these unidad de fomentos. And if you go around South America, and certainly until recently, you couldn't find a long-term bond any place. Yet the Chileans, because of this invention, I mean, we invented an institution, suddenly had a market that was acting in a reasonable fashion, more or less like our markets act in, in, the, in the mortgage markets, not as sophisticated, et cetera, et cetera. But at least they were able to have a mortgage market. If you go to other countries in Latin America, it turns out you, if you want to buy a house, you have to pay cash. Well, you know, going back again, going back to the Israeli example, there was a specific explicit proposal for dollarization of the Israeli economy. Absolutely, right. No, that's and the Minister of Finance right. and his chief advisor wanted to propose it. And the result, when it was made public, there was an outcry against right. it, and they were forced out of office. They were disgraced. It was a crazy idea. They wanted to dollarize it. Uh, it's now, the funny thing, but we need to talk about a crucial feature of what was being discussed, which is it's when a country has its own currency, the country makes money from the sale of that currency. Uh, now, the proposal in, in Israel was that Israel write a deal with the United States in which the United States would pay Israel a considerable amount, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, uh, for Israel declaring that the dollar was the currency of Israel. So <coughs> they, the, they, they were turning down this cash cow revenue from the Federal Reserve, which was being proposed. Um, it's interesting if it would have had a different outcome if it had been approached in a slightly different way, which is to keep the, uh, the, uh, is the shekel, shekel, the Israeli monetary unit, uh, but have the shekels administered and printed and controlled by the Federal Reserve in a way that made them uh, have a, a fixed relation to the dollar. And the same deal probably would have gone through if it had, if it had just preserved a national monetary unit instead in of calling it the dollar. That's what I found most interesting See, that's about what the episode was the extent of national feeling which attaches itself. Right. That's yeah. why when people say to me, so far as the Russians are concerned, why don't they use the dollar? Right. 
Yeah. There's no reason no. they shouldn't use a dollar. Yeah. They'd be better off if they used a dollar. It would be a sensible thing for them to do, but they won't do it. Right, but they could. No, see, that's what, I mean, the, the, the one of the proposals that I would make to Russia or to Ukraine, which is another uh, large, uh, you know, a country that has not in the last 70 years had a monetary unit, but which is now creating one, would be to create one, give it their own name, but then make a deal with the Federal Reserve Bank or the, or the Central Bank of Germany uh, under which it would be out of their control and they would get the revenue from it. And there would be billions of dollars of revenue available for a big country. Uh, and they could get the revenue advantage and the name advantage but not have the instability. They could buy the stability that uh, a, an established Western Central Bank can provide. It seems to me that it would be an attractive this Well, well Dan, 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 some years ago, made a specific proposal that's almost, it's better than the one you've suggested, really, for Russia. <laughs> No, get I just what I proposed for for Russia was that uh, um, I'm going to simplify it, make it dollar only for a minute. But what I propose is something like the currency board, like they use in Hong Kong. Sure, which or is did use it, yeah, it's not is you create yeah, a new they ruble. They do have now. Well, go on. They have it. They have it in Hong Kong still a currency board in Hong Kong. But you issue something called a new ruble. Say it's equal to one dollar. My proposal is one dollar plus two Deutsche marks, um, in order to have less fluctuation in the real exchange yeah. value of it. But you have a thing created called the Exchange Fund, seven-man board of directors, four Russians, one from Daiichi Congo Bank, one from Citibank, and one from Deutsche Bank, the three big, biggest banks in the three biggest countries. Uh, you have the books of this, this organization audited once a month and by a Western auditing firm. Because in Switzerland. <laughs> or yes, right. Pricewaterhouse or someone right. like that. Right. And they print it in Pravda, the newspaper called Truth back then. Um, and there, because no Russian believes anything the government says right, right now. Right, so you right. just have to start from that, that precept or that, that supposition. And then whenever the, the, the one characteristic is that this new ruble is redeemable either into one dollar, and in my case, one dollar plus two Deutsche Marks, anywhere in the world. And that's the only thing the exchange fund's allowed to do. They take the proceeds from the creation of this currency, they place it on deposit in New York and in Frankfurt and they earn the interest, which is your Just seniors exactly that you've been right, talking exactly about. Right. And yeah. it's basically, it's controlled in the sense that you have this board that consists of some foreigners, and you also have outside auditors, so they can't really go and steal the money without, without getting into trouble, without people knowing about it. And that was my proposal, and I actually made this proposal at Moscow State University, and I, I put the, your imprimatur on it, I said, well, I showed it to Milton Friedman, he said, yep, 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 they'll, It'll work. They'll never do it. And the whole audience busted up laughing <laughs> because they said, why, why won't we do it? This is back in 1989 when Glasnost was going and there was no perestroika at all. And they said, we'll do it. We could do whatever we want in the Soviet Union at that time now. And it turns out they were actually right. You could do lots of things. But, uh, but if you take, it, take that plan for a moment, what people always ask when you propose them is, well, where w <coughs> all right, you're going to print rubles. And the only way you can get a ruble is by depositing a dollar. Who's going to deposit dollars to get rubles? Well, in fact, the answer is very simple, but, uh, but leaves a problem. The answer is that <coughs> foreign investors who want to invest in, uh, in Russia will bring money in. This has to be accompanied by provisions within Russia for security of private property and for the fact that people who make money there can convert it back into dollars and take it out so that uh, uh, investors, foreign investors. But I've also, also thought that it might well be that many uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, nomenclatura who had secreted the foreign exchange outside sure. might find this a convenient way to launder their money back into the country. It, it's, it's not that much money. What I had actually recommended was export industries have to pay their workers in this new currency. Yeah. Is what I'd, what you I'd know, historically, it's never been a problem for a country to get its national currency and its national unit in use. I mean, the leading example is the United States. The, there was no such thing as a dollar. Uh, the dollar was created by Congress uh, after the U.S. was formed, uh, and the use of the dollar became universal immediately uh, after the dollar was created by Congress. And it didn't, there's no law in the United States that says you have to use dollars. But what the problem mm -hmm. is, the reason why there's a real problem here, is that uh, you're talking about the benefits to a country from being able to create this currency. You're talking about the seniorage, which is really the interest on the money. Right. But in a case like Russia, there's a large stock 
that could be produced to fiat money without any backing, right. which would be dollar for dollar valuable. The reason for the resistance for it, to it is that when the Russian government now prints rubles, it buys goods with the rubles. It doesn't simply get the benefit of the interest on those rubles, it buys goods with the rubles. Now, in fact, it is driving up prices. Oh, no, no, wait, no, no. no That's the, exactly equivalent to buying the securities with it, which you get the interest. The interest is the present. No, but they're buying, they get, they get to they spend get the money right now. Right. So they get to buy things well, right now. But then now. they don't get the interest. No, it's they the same. don't. Yeah, it's okay. one it's or the, the same other. Thing. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Economically, it's the same. Economi no, it's not well, the, the present, same. It just depends on their discount rate. Which okay, is you're 50% right. of your discount it's rate. it's not the same. Okay. But w w what's going on with this? this so there's a few problems. First of all, no one believes their government. Okay, this government, all the governments in the Soviet Union, are totally, in the minds of the people, untrustworthy. No one right. is to believe anything anyone says. And if you really want to get a currency out in circulation, I think you have to have it really believable. Now, I did a little ad hoc study, and I determined that Russia has per capita income equal to Malaysia, and Malaysia has currency as a fraction of GNP equal to 10%. And then I made my own calculation multiplying one times the other, and that I did it for the entire Soviet Union. I estimated they need $60 billion of currency in circulation in order to run that economy. Um, that's high for Russia. Let's say that's $35 billion today is what they would need. If you go and you start to say, what would happen to inventories in that country if they had a currency instead of everyone stockpiling goods and s goods because there's no functioning monetary system, we're talking about huge amounts of money. We're talking 50% of GNP in excess inventory in a country like Russia. If you look at the United States' inventory to sales ratios, we're much, much lower than a country like Russia. And you could see for the country as a whole, maybe not for the nomenclature, not for the individual who gets to steal the money, steal those goods and services right away. But if you just look for the country as a whole, tremendous savings for it right away, just in, in savings on inventory. But they still won't do it. No, oh, well, they're, they're, no, I think the, 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 the benefits that Dan's <laughs> talking about, I think they're, they're well aware of and trying very hard to get. Those are benefits that any reasonable monetary system would deliver. Oh, no, they're trying to get that, but they, they won't do what they won't do. Yeah, this, this idea, you know. Because in order for, for Dan's program to work, there's an additional thing that's necessary. They have to allow the old rubles to trade at a free market rate relative to the new rubles. That was a much bigger okay, problem. Well, you know, two that's, years a, ago. that's a very. When, when that was $1.6 per ruble, everyone yeah. thought that they had a savings account. So you would go to someone and you'd say, well, How much do you have in your savings account? And he would say, I have 5,000 rubles. And he thought he had something because it looked like $8,000. And since the inflation that's happened since the beginning of the year, that problem has, quote unquote, been solved. Now you go to that person, he says, I have 8,000 rubles. And it's 150 rubles per dollar, so now he has a $50 savings Wait, account. Wait, I thought the inflation was caused by them printing a whole bunch of new rubles. No, there was so a, no, a one-time... there been a decline in the... There was a one-time change in the price level that had been a repressed 7 to 800 percent inflation. This is back in 1989. Right, right. As soon as they took the controls off, these people thought they had claims on goods and services equal to 8,000 or 10,000 right, rubles okay. at so was the pre-existing price level. It turned out these were fictitious because they were claims on nothing. So these the purchasing power, we now know that the purchasing power of the outstanding old rubles is less of a... Oh, no, I was talking savings everything. account, not rubles, oh, not, not pieces of paper. Or everything so a lot of people's wealth was in savings accounts and banks, and that wealth was essentially destroyed. So that problem, what are you going to do with people's money? What are we going to do with this old ruble? It's going to trade at a free so market. The so-called ruble hangover has disappeared. Well, yeah, it's gone now, isn't it? Now, now everyone realizes that their wage is $8 tell, a month. Tell me something. How many dollars are in circulation, literal dollars, are in circulation? In the, I, don't, I know you can't give a precise answer, but is it a foolish question to, uh, to suppose, is it foolish to suppose that there are quite a large number of dollars no, over there? not at all. I mean, especially now you could see that the Soviet private sector is running what we would call a balance of payment surplus. This all is a question of how do you build up the reserves of the country. It can be done privately. I give, I go and I buy an opera ticket. I go and buy a ticket to the Bolshoi. I pay someone in dollars for that. He's figured out a way to buy it in rubles. I buy it from him for $20. He takes the $20. He sticks it in his pocket. I've just bought a non-tradable good. He's running a personal, private balance of payment surplus. And I'm going to guess we're up to $5 billion already of the 35 I need, just as a guess. And I, I you know. Do you think that the, there the are the Fed $5 has billion? Dollars? I would bet. I mean, $5 that billion would be U.S. greenbacks circulating in five Three. Hard three. No. three. I, I really? don't know. I, I would, I would well, rather defer to someone at the Fed who's probably studied this. Some years ago, uh, no, a year or two ago, when the U.S. currency outstanding was going up very rapidly, I estimated how much excess it was 
by just extrapolating the past thing. Mm -hmm. okay. And I came to something like six or seven billion dollars in a year. Well, just so look what's happened this last couple of years. This, this last year is another explosion. What is the total? Do you remember what the total amount of currency in the United States is? Two hundred and seven billion. Yeah, currency. I was going to say, it's, it's $2,000 per, per family. And I don't know any family that holds $2,000. No, no, of course, so nobody does. It's somewhere else in the world. Well, it's there's no question where so half on. of it yeah. is, in, is in tills or in ATM oh, accounts. No. Maybe. In tills? No, I think it, 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 the first principle of business is that you try to keep, keep almost nothing Well, maybe not half. But uh, maybe, uh, first of all, a lot of it is lost. A lot of it is held by black marketeers right. and racketeers. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of it is overseas. Absolutely. We're having a 10 lot of it is growth. Well, well, in another interesting there's fact. There's 10% growth in that portion of M1 going on right mm -hmm. now. People look at U.S. monetary numbers and it's they're saying there's no out. growth M2, there's no growth in M3, and you look at currency base, sure, it's just yeah. exploding. And yeah, the, the, I'd have the to make some calculations, but I saw greenbacks everywhere in Moscow. And in, and so in you Senior are, in fact, typically. getting dollarization in Moscow. Oh, sure. See, I've always argued that the only way you'll really get privatization in Moscow is not by government edict, but by people stealing the property and converting it oh, into that's private property. Well, exactly what's going on. There's enterprises within state-owned exactly. which are unrelated to what the state factory is doing. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things in, in, in the Soviet Union, is, or now in, in Russia, is they talked about their gold stock that they had. For years, you'd hear about this 2,000 or 4,000 metric ton gold supply that they'd have. And in fact, uh, an, one economist, uh, I think we'll let him rename, remain nameless, said that the Russians should go on a gold standard because look at all this gold they have. And well, you know a what member happened? of the it's, me yeah, it's <laughs> Wayne Angel, a member of the uh, and uh, someone the went over on that same board. trip. Jude Winiski yeah. went over and said we should do a gold standard. Look at all that gold, and it turns out, guess what happened? All the gold was stolen, and there's only 200 metric tons, if there's anything at all. That gold has been stolen by someone, and it's gone. You start telling these stories to people in Russia, and they said, of course, you know, I know this guy who had a friend who had a friend who had a friend, and, and the, all the normal couture got together, and they stole everything. Um, so I think, I keep coming back to the fact that I don't trust any of the governments there, no one trusts any of the people there, and everyone is close to starvation in, in a, in a, not that, not truly close to starvation, but they're living very poorly. They see people from the West living very well, and they wonder why. I have a PhD in chemistry or a PhD in economics. Why should I make eight dollars a month, and why should you make five thousand dollars a month? That's not fair. And it's not. <laughs> 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 they vote with their feet. <laughs> but, but I think, for in my mind, the most important thing is who's going to believe that government, and that's why. Yeah, that's why right. both, you know, both of us have variants of the same idea, which is to get credible. Uh, governments in other countries involved in producing the local currency so that the local currency has the credibility that it needs. Well, the advantage his stable. has over yours is that his would be a Russian established institution but with foreign private individuals mm -hmm. certifying the honesty or the accuracy of its performance. The only thing they could do is so resign. So it's not like it's not like you could go and sue Price Waterhouse if they, sti if they steal the money. Or, or sue Citibank or Daiichi Congo Bank. But what they will do is they'll say, we're resigning from the board, and then no one's going to trust them again. But, you know, it is it's interesting. There's implicit belief here that Price Waterhouse has more credibility than the Federal Reserve Bank. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I leave that does. as an open question. <laughs> are you, who are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the problem, I would never recommend it, the Federal Reserve guarantee anything like that because it, that gives the, the Russians an inroad into our treasury, which I don't want oh, to Oh, no, no. I would but you see, the reason, would why, the, the reason why this about. won't happen is not because the Russians would be incapable of doing it, no. but because the IMF will not let them do it. The IMF and the U.S. government and the other governments are all hell-bent on providing a stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, sure. This whole idea that... For the ruble. They're all hell-bent on the idea that the ruble has to be stabilized. Not that there should be a new currency created. Not that they should have a different set of institutions but somehow that the uh, Russia has to have a central bank like the central bank right, of France, right, like the central right, bank. Right, right. That's and the that's a terrible idea. Right. Russia that's doesn't exactly need a central right. bank. Yeah. yeah, that's right. There are so yeah. many crazy things that happened during this transition. There was just one other thing uh, that, that I found interesting. When the price controls were taken off in January of 1992, suddenly the free market price of the ruble relative to the dollar went down in price. So it went from 150 rubles to 75 rubles per dollar. And everyone said, well, why is that? And you said, is the government running a smaller deficit? No. 
governments running the same size deficit. Have they stopped their printing press? No. What had happened, however, is you had state-owned stores raising the prices of the goods they sell. And since all the state-owned stores would take their proceeds, their till money, and they would hand it on to their higher or entity, which would then hand it on to its higher entity, which would net be the central bank of the Soviet Union, essentially, when prices went up to the free market level, the government, in, in fact, actually ran a budget surplus for those that month. And suddenly, the money supply was halved. <laughs> and it was engaged in open market was, operations. It was engaged in open in market operations. It was selling off physical <laughs> goods and services instead it was, of bonds. It was selling sausages and destroying money. Every sale of a sausage would cause a, a destruction of money. And that actually caused a strengthening of, of the ruble in real terms. So that was, it was many crazy things happened there, but essentially you had 100,000 central banks because yeah. all, every entity being government owned and having an account at the Russian central bank, which would get debited or credited depending on whether they're buying or selling something, was essentially acting like a central bank. And this is just insane. There's no way to run monetary policy. Uh, and, and Milton's got exactly right that um, there's this huge pressure from international agencies saying there's only one way to do it. You have to have a central bank just like the central banks. And they're, they're essentially distorting decisions that could be made in very different directions uh, in, a more, in a healthier way. Uh, there's been a lot of commentary that the currency board uh, answer, which worked so well uh, in the former uh, colonies of, of the British Empire, would be a natural answer in one form or another, even if it's not administered by outsiders. Uh, it's a, it's in terms of reducing the bureaucracy, it's a much better alternative to a central well, bank. Essentially and it has more credibility. Than well, essentially bank. what Dan is suggesting is a currency. Yeah, exactly. Right. But but I but he, his idea was that they, you'd have outsiders on the, on the board of directors, and the, even if that's unacceptable in Russia, uh, even if it's all Russians on the board, still the principle of the currency board, uh, which says that we take in foreign denominated backing, 100% foreign denominated backing for our currency, and we keep our currency on exact par with, with the, uh, with whatever foreign currency is. We've, you know, the, the the Deutsche Mark would probably be the logical currency for. But Russia. you know, we have a good example of what happens when these uh, ideas we're talking about, the the usual ideas that you have to have a central bank, are carried out. Poland. Now, mm -hmm. Poland got a great deal of attention out of doing a very radical thing. What was a radical thing it did? It accepted a, a stabilization fund from the West. It decided to stabilize the Sloty. Uh, when was it? January 1st, 1990? 90, yeah. 1990. Yeah. It stabilized it at a f supposedly a fixed exchange rate with the dollar and the mark. Uh, and, of course, in order to make it at all sensible, it stabilized it at a rate that greatly undervalued the Zelote. Right. That is to say, uh, I, we were there in uh, late 1990, September or October, and everything was dirt cheap still, because the Zelote, was, in dollars that is, because the Zelote was undervalued. And what happened? The undervalued Zelote did lead to making Polish goods cheap, foreign goods exp uh, uh, expensive, and so they did create a ba they started to export. They created a balance of payment surplus. It all went to finance government expenditures, which kept the inefficient state enterprises in right, operation. Right, right, okay. mm -hmm. And so gradually, and over time, and there's, there's inflation continued within Poland because they were printing money for their domestic purposes. And gradually, from being undervalued, the slowly got it back up to where it was properly valued. And then. It got overvalued, and I, uh, now I don't you're going to have the problem. Now the problem they did you have is what so they did. What did they do? I don't, I don't know if they've devalued yet. But I think the, they did. The problem now is you've told yeah. the citizenry that we have this thing that's fixed. This is a people who don't. Well, in the case of Poland, they obviously better remember capitalism. But they're coming out of 40, 50 years without it, and you've suddenly said this is a currency which has been fixed, and now all of a sudden it isn't. So the government's broken its word. Now, they don't know why the government's broken its word. They don't connect the fact that their the Zloty is no longer the same numbers per dollar. W they don't put that in their mind with the fact that they've been having a, uh, a bailout of the next door factory. They don't realize that the two are connected. And these people are sitting there and they say, my God, the government breaks its word on that. What else is it going to break their word on? So all of a sudden, the government, which has no credibility, loses credibility again. And it's just a very, very dangerous cycle where you could fix it for a while, but you're setting yourself up for a fall if you don't bring private enterprise in place if you don't balance your budget, if you don't do all the things you're supposed to do. And it's just 
you're, you're setting yourself up for a fall, which I find very dangerous for these countries. You know, Vaclav Klaus, who was the finance minister of uh, Czechoslovakia, and who on the whole is doing a very good job, uh, was asked not long ago when he was in the, uh, either in this country or Canada, I'm not sure, what was the biggest obstacle, his, big, his biggest obstacle, his biggest problem that he was facing in, in, in uh, trying to bring Czechoslovakia to a market, proper market system. He said it's that low, it's that stream of advisors from the West. <laughs> <laughs> from which university? <laughs> he didn't say which university. He said, he really was, was talking about government un right, advisors yeah, as yes, well as sure. university advisors. Right. Because he says they're all over here trying to tell us that we've got to be a little bit more socialist. Exactly, right. Yes, the, the well, it's the natural thing for a government bureaucrat to try to... to no, I, but the, the thing that really is, drives you crazy is that there are 